Good evening, everyone. I'm Dean Lee Softly, and I welcome you this evening to the webinar entitled Environmental and Climate Justice, Anti-Racist Movements and Principles for Practice. It is such an honor for me to be introducing this timely and important webinar. And I am delighted to welcome viewers from across the globe, from New England and from right here in Maine, including several of Maine's legislators. Before I turn the evening over to Josh Rosen for some introductions, I wanna thank this extraordinary panel of professors who have joined us this evening. They join us from Hawaii, Vermont, Northeastern University, and the Yale School of Law. These are difficult and extremely busy times for everyone in the legal community. And we are so grateful to have these amazing panelists and we thank them for their time and their commitment to this important topic. I also wanna take just a moment to thank the Energy and Environmental Law section of the Student Bar Association at Maine Law for bringing anti-racist and anti-discrimination spotlight to this area of law. George Floyd died five months ago. In the intervening months, we have all redoubled our efforts to examine issues of injustice in every aspect of the law. This webinar provides us all with an opportunity to consider climate justice issues, not just from the perspective of science, but also through the lens of civil rights and social justice, seeking to make justice for all a reality. I am so proud of the members of Maine Law's Student Bar Association and the Energy and Environmental Law section for their work in presenting this topic tonight. So to Josh Rosen and Allison Briggs and all of the students on the Energy and Environmental Law section, and to Professors Thaler, Schindler, and Moffa, as well as Carrie Weiler and uh, Michaeline Decro, our wonderful technology gurus, and all of the main law staff who have helped put this together, and especially to all of tonight's panelists, many thanks. Josh Rosen, thank you for your work. The floor, or should I say the screen, is yours. <laughs> thank you, Dean Softley. On behalf of the Energy and Environmental Law Society, known as EELS, at the University of Maine School of Law, to our several hundred participants tonight, welcome. A special thank you to Dean Softley, EELS advisor and Professor Jeff Thaler, and many Maine Law staff and faculty who helped us execute this important event. I'd like to take a brief opportunity to also thank our sponsors for this event, the University of Maine Graduate and Professional Center, the Graduate School of Business, and the Maine School of Law. Additionally, thank you to our nonprofit community partners, the Maine Conservation Voters, and E2 Tech who helped us promote this event to Maine audiences. Just to give a quick background, EELS provides Maine Law students with a forum to discuss, understand, and gain access to the expansive fields of energy and environmental law and the people who lead them. Early this summer, EELS leadership met to map out our focus for the upcoming year, just as the ongoing fight for racial justice in the United States gained a national and international spotlight, and many Americans began to awaken to the undeniable life and death consequences of systemic racism. EELS felt that it had an obligation to help continue this awakening and in doing so, broaden our understanding of racial injustice beyond the realms of the criminal justice system. As we'll learn more about tonight, beyond the criminal justice system, there is also a pervasive system of disproportionate burdens imposed upon communities of color and indigenous peoples, as well as upon low-income communities. And tonight, we hope to discuss and learn how to make those systems a bit more equitable, a bit more just. As we set out to identify speakers for this event, it became clear that the new Zoom pandemic reality we found ourselves in meant that we could access speakers and also audiences from across the world in a way that Maine Law might not have otherwise been able to. So I was stunned and deeply grateful when all four of our fantastic speakers you'll hear from tonight very quickly agreed to speak with us. Thank you to our panelists, truly national and international leaders in the fields of environmental and climate justice who graciously agreed to share their knowledge with us on this late Monday evening. Vice President Allison Briggs and I will now introduce our panel, but before we begin, I would like to encourage audience members to submit questions throughout tonight's discussion 
through the Zoom Q&A portal. After our four speakers conclude their presentations, EELS advisor and Professor Jeff Thaler will moderate what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion. Our first panelist tonight, Professor Gerald Torres, is a professor of environmental justice at the Yale School of the Environment and professor of law at Yale School of Law. Professor Torres is an acclaimed global scholar of environmental law, critical race theory, and federal Indian law. He served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the U.S. Department of Justice during the Clinton administration, where he played a crucial role in developing the first federal policy on environmental justice. His work also includes a study of conflicts over resource management between Native American tribes, states, and the federal government. Professor Torres' past work has also examined how U.S. regulations have led to racially or ethnically marginalized communities bearing a disproportionate share of environmental burdens. Our second panelist, Professor Marion Engelman Lotto, is the director of Vermont Law's Environmental Justice Clinic, visiting professor, Douglas Kossel Chair in Environmental Law, and senior faculty fellow at Vermont Law's Environmental Law Center. Professor Engelman Lotto direct Vermont's, directs Vermont's Law's Environmental Justice Clinic, which focuses on civil rights enforcement in the environmental justice context. She also serves as a lecturer at both the Yale University School of Public Health and Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She previously served as a staff attorney at Earth Justice, where she focused on civil rights enforcement, as well as issues related to the areas of toxics, waste, and the health impacts of our industrial agriculture, and the effects of environmental contamination on vulnerable and overburdened populations. She served as 10 years as general counsel at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest and began her career as a staff attorney at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. And I'll now turn it to Vice President Allison Briggs to introduce our next two speakers. Hi, good evening. Our third panelist, Dr. Danny Faber, is a professor of sociology and director of the Northeastern Environmental Justice Research Collaborative at Northeastern University. Dr. Faber's research is focused in the areas of political economy and crisis theory, environmental sociology and policy, social movements, environmental justice, climate justice, and globalization. He is a co-founding senior editor of the international journal Capitalism, Nature, and Socialism. His most recent work is concerned with the political economy of environmental injustice and climate justice. He is currently writing a new book, The Ecological Contradiction contradictions of American capitalism towards a more transformative environmental politics. Our final panelist, Professor Maxine Burkett, is a professor of law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Professor Maxine Burkett is a professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law and a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She teaches climate change law and policy, torts, ocean and coastal law, and international law. An expert in the law and policy of climate change, she has written extensively in diverse areas of climate change law with a particular focus on climate justice. Exploring policy responses to climate change's impacts on vulnerable communities in the U.S. and globally. Our Q&A tonight will be moderated by EELS advisor and professor of practice Jeff Thaler. Professor Jeff Thaler is a professor of practice at the University of Maine School of Law and served as Associate University Counsel for Environmental, Energy, and Sustainability Projects for the University of Maine system. He is also an associate faculty member of the University of Maine's Climate Change Institute. He has been the attorney for Maine's floating offshore wind program since its inception. Before joining the university, Professor Thaler conducted a wide ranging legal practice focused on environmental and energy permitting, compliance, enforcement, and litigation, as well as representing cl clients with personal injury, to toxic exposure, and professional malpractice claims. Phenomenal, thank you, Allison. Uh, Professor Torres, you have the floor. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And Professor Torres, you'll have unmute. There, I'm unmute. I should be unmuted now. Okay. Uh, Perfect. First, Thanks. Uh, I, I want to thank you for in, in, inviting me. I, uh, I uh, immediately agreed uh, when you told me who the other panelists were going to be. It meant that uh, I had to be here. Also, because uh, uh, Jeff, uh, Professor Thaler, 
and I have known each other uh, longer than probably most of the audience has been alive. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, what what I was asked to do tonight is to is to give a, a brief history of the uh, environmental justice movement. The history is is actually deep. Uh, if, if we want to trace some of the early efforts, you can go back to the 19th century, but the, the modern environmental justice movement probably uh, started, you could mark the, the starting date at a couple of places, it depends who you talk to. Uh, there was the uh, Memphis sanitation workers strike in 1968, uh, probably best remembered now infamously as the, the last uh, uh, place where the Reverend Martin Luther King spoke before he uh, was assassinated in, in, in Memphis. But that, while it was uh, a labor issue, it was also about uh, the sanitation and sanitary conditions in Memphis for, for people of color. And, and it does mark an important starting date. Uh, there was a meeting in, in 1978 uh, in Detroit between the uh, now I don't think it exists anymore, the uh, Environmentalist for Full Employment, the Sierra Club, uh, and the Urban League, where questions about the focus of a major environmental groups now called Big Green, basically, uh, why it left off uh, important constituencies uh, in, the, uh, in the urban uh, um, centers. The, uh, Sit in uh, against the Warren County uh, Hazardous Waste Dump, probably was uh, next in line in, in, in terms of uh, 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 actions in the United States. And then dramatically in 1984, uh, most of you, um, if you don't recall, you should go back and look. Uh, there was the, the uh, ghastly uh, event uh, in Bhopal, India where uh, 3,800 uh, people died almost uh, instantly uh, because of a, a gas leak from a pesticide plant. Uh, and then many more suffered uh, 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 injury, lingering injuries uh, due to, uh, to, to that uh, release. The General Accounting Office undertook a, a study after the, the Ward County uh, sit-in uh, and, and determined that most, three out of four of the hazardous waste sites were located in areas that were, were uh, heavily African-American and predominantly uh, poor. Then the, the landmark event, the thing that most everyone uh, notes as the pivot uh, around which uh, the modern environmental movement turns, was the uh, famous United Church of Christ uh, study in which it documented that holding other things equal, race was the uh, single largest factor that uh, explained why hazardous waste sites were located where they were. The origin of the, um, of the environmental justice movement in the events that I, I've told you about had one important effect, and that is that they uh, focused on a kind of local uh, politics, but then tried to put the local events into a, a framework in which uh, uh, process failure or other defects in the planning and decision-making process uh, could be understood as a kind of uh, systemic uh, bias against people of color. Uh, and uh, poor people uh, in particular. So the, the, what the United Church of Christ study did is it unleashed a, a, a lot of scholarly work. Uh, and so you have people like uh, Professor uh, Manuel Pastor, uh, Professor Bullard, uh, doing the hard work to try to document exactly what the, the claims uh, alleged and to see if they could get an alternative explanation. And the short answer was there wasn't an alternative explanation. The explanation is tied to the conditions of, of racial politics in the United States generally, uh, but also the uh, systematic disempowerment of uh, communities of color. So what we saw as the disproportionate 
environmental burden that these communities would have to face actually could be traced back to failures early, earlier on in, in the process. And so it wasn't just a particular uh, siding decision that was bad, or it wasn't uh, a particularly nefarious uh, actor in one uh, uh, place or another. Rather, it was the uh, systemic effect of the exclusion of these committees or alternatively, not just the exclusion, but the discounting of the kinds of hazards uh, they would face. And uh, uh, remarkably, it, it uh, demonstrated that the kinds of uh, burdens we saw in the environmental uh, area could be found uh, in, in other areas uh, of social life. If you turn to the work of my colleague, uh, Dorsita Taylor, right, you, you find, open up the, the, her volume on toxic communities, right? And what you find is the pervasive question that kept being asked, well, well, well why don't they move, right? That was one question. The other question that, that some scholars raised was whether uh, this was a case of what lawyers call coming to the nuisance. That is, uh, the location of these uh, uh, environmental uh, or locally un unwanted land uses uh, made property cheaper. And so it made it, it attracted people who couldn't afford uh, to buy property or own property in, in places that were, were more expensive. The subsequent research uh, de debunked both of those uh, uh, explanations. It, it, in fact, uh, far from coming to the nuisance, the, these communities were already there. They're already intact com communities that were already suffering from a uh, reduced access to what we consider kind of ordinary uh, uh, environmental amenities, clean water, uh, for example, but also uh, had insufficient capacity to make their views heard and known in the uh, political process and thus became uh, areas that essentially became zones of sacrifice. Uh, now, I, I focused on two things. One is the, the siding, and two is the uh, process failure. What's important to recognize is when you talk to environmental justice communities, typically they have a much broader idea of what environmental justice is than most lawyers uh, that I talk to have. They recognize, importantly, that uh, they are not against development, that uh, unemployment is, in fact, a uh, major stressor and a reduces life uh, expectancy, so that, that the, uh, the importance of the kind of development that occurred and the kind of uh, in, uh, economic, economic opportunities that were uh, advanced for communities became an important part of the discussion of what would constitute uh, environmental justice. In the Clinton administration, uh, we uh, took instruction, to, by and large, from the, uh, the uh, 17 uh, principles that the uh, first major um, national, uh, multinational people of color environmental leadership uh, 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 summit uh, organized. And we uh, asked, what could the federal government do? And the one thing that the executive order, executive order 12898 did was to instruct uh, the agencies to integrate into their planning process, environmental justice concerns. In some ways it, it parallels the change in decision-making that, that NEPA uh, uh, presaged. Uh, many people, of course, were skeptical when NEPA was passed, uh, suggesting that you know changing uh, uh, decision making with no fundamental substantive law to apply couldn't produce results. But what we discovered, going back and looking at the way decisions have changed, is that in fact, if you change the focus, you end up getting better decisions. And slowly, uh, the the uh, EPA through its Office of Environmental Justice and the other agencies with their environmental justice uh, offices have increasingly, not sufficiently, but have increasingly uh, taken environmental justice concerns uh, in, into account. The states as well have been active. So California, 
uh, has taken the, the lead in uh, enacting a number of environmental justice uh, statutes. And it too has asked its agencies to take environmental justice concerns into account through the planning process. New Jersey, just what, two weeks ago, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, passed an environmental justice uh, uh, statute designed specifically to address the process failures that I've discussed uh, up till now. Indigenous people uh, in what, the mid uh, 80s uh, created the Indigenous Peoples Network. Uh, the uh, Latinx communities have created a network of environmental justice. Together though, one of the things I discovered when I was meeting with the groups in anticipation of the executive order was that there are a lot of, uh, uh, while race may be the most salient factor, poverty is also a salient factor. And the interaction of those two is, is a critical set of uh, interactions to understand. So uh, where we are now is of course, with the current events being, uh, bringing the idea of racial justice back to the, the, uh, the center stage is that environmental justice has also taken a hold of the issues of racial justice and it's been moved onto the agenda. And I suspect it will be uh, going forward. The future of environmental regulation is actually the, uh, the future of environmental justice. And I think we're gonna see that. Thank you and I'd be happy to answer questions later. Thank you, Professor Torres. Uh, we'll now hear Professor Marian Engelman Lotto. Thank you. Thanks. I'm just going to share my screen and I'm hoping that somebody will let me know if this works. Just a second. Speak. Perfect. There we go. Okay. I am honored to be part of this panel and. Um, and uh, it's both unfortunate and fortunate to follow Gerald Torres. Uh, fortunate because I always learn something and uh, he, he laid it out so well. Um, I'm gonna start with the photographs in this first slide. The uh, photograph on the left is Stone's Throw Landfill in, um, in the Asher Bar Smith community in Tallahassee, Alabama. And I've been working with the community there and it's really been my honor to work with the community there for a number of years. Um, you're looking at the landfill from the road, uh, Washington Boulevard, and right across the road, people live. And this is what they see. And this is a beautiful area with hills. And um, this area was settled by newly uh, freed enslaved persons right after the Civil War. It's a Freedmen's Bureau town. And people who had uh, no wealth to pass on to their uh, children and grandchildren were able to buy some land, 300 acres, 500 acres, and generation after generation has have lived on that land um, and uh, passed it down from, from uh, family member to family member. And oftentimes three, four generations live on the land together. And people used to walk around and, and drink from the springs and uh, bike in the streets. And now these narrow roadways uh, are filled with uh, 18 wheelers that come every minute and are going too fast. There are no street lights and uh, the area smells uh, to high heaven. And this is what they see. And their property is devalued and they feel that they're getting cancer. And in fact, the landfill has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger as people die or feel like they must move away. And people who uh, have valued this land as their family property, as the only legacy of their uh, parents and grandparents and great grandparents uh, now feel like maybe they don't want to give this land to their children because uh, it will poison them. I'll talk more about Tallahassee, Alabama in a few minutes. On the right is a picture of um, the New Hope Church Cemetery, which is a historic black cemetery um, at, that sits on land for which nobody can find title because that land came from a plantation. And the plantation owners had said to the church, the black church, you can use this land. But then they sold uh, much of the rest of the land right next to the cemetery to another landfill, Arrowhead Landfill, which is one of the largest landfills, uh, not only in Alabama, but um, 
on the East Coast, it's permitted to take uh, waste from 33 states. That's our waste from the entire Eastern seaboard. And uh, it's also permitted to take coal ash. And it took 4 million tons of coal ash that were shipped more than 300 miles away from Tennessee after an enormous disaster in Kingston, Tennessee from a predominantly white community shipped to this community, which has about 2,000 people. It's 90% African-American. And the per capita income is about $10,000. This is in part what um, environmental justice is about. Why is it that these communities communities with strong people, with resilient lives, with churches, with uh, birthdays, who, who lived outside, who had a rural way of life. Why is it that they're not listened to, their governments are not responsive to them, and they're, they, have, uh, they have lost ability to enjoy fresh air, clean water, and they have a disproportionate um, burden from all of us in society to take waste and to take the burdens of environmental hazards. And putting it in a slightly different and maybe more instrumental way, if you're not convinced that that's not right, the more we put garbage and landfills and waste in communities that have been disadvantaged and that uh, where their government isn't listening to them, the less likely we as a society have the uh, incentives to change the way we do things, to stop creating these waste piles to stop polluting the air. And until we distribute benefits and burdens evenly, until we listen to all communities and value their rights to clean air and clean water, we won't make the same the kind of changes we need to make. Um, so just a little bit about my background. I was introduced, but I, I just want to emphasize that I have a civil rights background. I started my career and went to work in the law um, precisely to work on issues of racial justice. And I happened to be at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund at the time that Professor Torres was talking about when there was the first People of Color in National Environmental Summit. And, um, and, and so though I had never thought of the words environmental justice, I was working on access to health care and racial discrimination and education. Um, over time, I have moved more and more to this issue of environmental justice. And in part, it's because it is so compelling. It is an issue of life and death. And also it's been just an honor to work with people around the country who are demanding that they be heard and demanding justice. Um, and so uh, this has been um, a big part of my life. Um, about three years ago, I left uh, the full-time just practice of um, environmental justice or uh, civil rights and in the environmental context to start a clinic. And as was mentioned, I, I wear two hats. I, I'm at the uh, Vermont Law School and, and run an environmental justice clinic there. And this is the mission of the clinic, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I also work at uh, Yale and we run uh, a collaborative climate justice clinic between Vermont Law School and Yale. And both of them um, are really geared toward training students to provide technical assistance. When I think about um, this interdisciplinary work, whether you're a law student, whether you're a public health student, whether you're a policy student, to, to rethink the way we think about our own careers, uh, to be in service to communities. That the idea of environmental justice, which Professor Torres just talked about, is that people have the right uh, to have their own voice. And so we are technical service providers. And in the clinic, we seek to advance the environmental justice movement by enforcing civil rights and providing technical assistance to develop uh, to communities to develop and implement legal strategies as appropriate for them. And the training of students is to train them to whatever their career is going to be, to be listening and respectful and sensitive to people's right to speak for themselves and to define their own agenda. Um, uh, Professor Torres has already talked about the core starting point um, for environmental justice, so I won't spend a lot of time. I would add that in addition to the distributive justice, um, that uh, issues that, um, that were talked about, that there's a substantive piece about the right to clean air and clean water. Um, and uh, the distributive justice issue is not only um, the, 
distribution of environmental hazards, but also the distribution of environmental benefits. Who has access to parks? Who has access to places to play? As well as the procedural rights that, um, that uh, have been discussed already. I just want to emphasize these principles of environmental justice. They not only apply to government, but in our practice, when I think of what we're doing, these principles of environmental justice apply to us. That is, if I think about what our clinic is doing or what any lawyer is doing, um, we have to keep in mind that environmental justice, and this is number seven on the slide, demands the right to participate as equal partners at every level of decision making including needs assessment, planning, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. It demands respect, uh, policy based on mutual respect. So that's not only what does the Department of Justice say or what does a state agency do, it's what do we do in our practice? How are we listening to the voices of communities and making sure they're informing our priorities and the way in which we practice? Maybe it goes without saying that the goals of legal action in the environmental justice context are not just getting a decisive court ruling. Of course, we all want a decisive court ruling when we can get one or having a court tell people to stop doing something bad. Um, and of course, also all legal claims must be non-frivolous. But environmental justice lawyering, including creating political space, for example, through NEPA and, and the procedural rights, enforcing the procedural rights that Professor Torres talked about. It also includes articulating a narrative and one of the arguments I would make for enforcing civil rights is it, it brings to visibility the issues of race that if we're only talking about environmental law get suppressed, that people in overburdened communities of color know that but for race, they would not be in this situation. And if we don't recognize that, if we don't bring it out of the margins, all that tension, all that knowledge is within a person. And we need to bring it out into the open and discuss it. And we can also, in, in tandem with articulating a narrative, build a record through discovery, through FOIA, through other kinds of legal action. We can get information that helps support community-based activity. And litigation and other forms of lawyering must be intended to support community-based movement, community-based power. Um, it also may go without saying that when I talk about legal action, I'm not only talking about litigation, but also all kinds of lawyering functions, investigation, communications, organizing, uh, providing transactional assistance, etc. And in our clinic, uh, we do all these things. We have litigation. Um, CARE versus uh, EPA is a, a case we co-counsel with uh, Earth Justice on behalf of five communities, including that community in Tallahassee, Alabama. They had all filed civil rights complaints more than 10 years earlier before we filed the litigation. And EPA has 180 days to investigate a complaint. There were those complaints that had all been accepted for investigation, just gathering dust at EPA. And we brought suit saying, you have 180 days. It's instead been 10 years, or in case of Flint, Michigan, it's been 20 years. And, uh, and we won the case, not surprisingly. Um, we do FOIA work to get information back to the community. We advise communities on state legislation and federal legislation, such as the Environmental Justice for All Act and the EJ Act of 2019. I'd be happy to talk about both of those. We do community engagement and policy formation. We do research. We're currently involved in a 50-state survey of environmental justice laws. We do administrative advocacy, and we investigate um, to, to uh, determine whether we can bring cases um, together with communities. All of this is based on a theory of change rooted in supporting community action. Of course, we not only use civil rights strategies, but we rely on the alphabet soup of environmental laws. And here are some of them at the state and federal level. What I wanna focus on in my remaining minute or two is our work on, on behalf of communities um, under the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination by public and private recipients of federal funds. And uh, here's, you can have these slides later. Here's a, a copy of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Every agency of the federal government, which interprets the law, um, requires uh, that recipients of federal funds, universities, um, uh, hospitals, state agencies, um, not only don't discriminate on the basis of race in intent, but also not take actions which have the effect of subjecting individuals to discrimination. 
And so um, this is really important. Um, and I, I want to build on something Professor Torres said. Um, you have to think about the fact that um, discrimination is baked into our land use. I mean, if you think about how this country was racially segregated, and after formal segregation ended, people didn't say, oh, let's change all the zoning laws. Let's root out all of those decisions that were made. And that didn't happen. And so on top of the decisions that were made before, we have industrial zones, uh, residential zones. We still have segregation. And so it's not surprising that our land use efforts um, today are built on this backbone of uh, discrimination in the way we use our land. And so we shouldn't be looking for the intent to discriminate, but we should be acting, asking ourselves, um, do we, uh, stopping ourselves saying, is our action that we're taking now, does it have the uh, uh, a racially disproportionate impact that's not justified? Um, there are all kinds of potential violations under the law. I'm gonna go really quickly. We partner with groups all across the country and with um, individual activists in all of these different ways. This is again, Tallahassee, Alabama, which I wanted to tell you a little bit more about. And just to highlight the people who are at the core of this, this is Ann Smith. She filed complaints way back in, um, decades ago and her son, Ron Smith, who's in this picture, uh, carries the ball today and it's generation after generation trying to save their, their legacy, the legacy of their ancestors. This is a picture in Tallahassee of where this landfill is. This orange is the landfill and, and this is how much it's growing. And this pink is black owned land. And the Alabama in its wisdom decided to permit under RICRA, under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, this landfill, though it was having this effect on the community. And of course that's part of a larger problem of black land loss, lest we think it's just an accident. I'm gonna go real quickly and say, you know, part of what we do is try to win cases and, and we won this case. Part of what we do is really try to help support the community. And, and um, this, this landfill's still there, that we have not been successful. But one thing we have done is show up and the community has organized around change and hundreds of people are now going to community meetings and uh, challenging the permit um, that the state of Alabama has given it. Just want to highlight in my last minute a couple of other things, then I'll stop. Um, in addition to doing that administrative advocacy and, and litigation, I mentioned that we we do um, research and we do community partnerships. And we have this partnership in, in Vermont called Rejoice, um, that is community-led participatory research. We do surveys, we do spatial analysis, and we're making policy recommendations. And Professor Torres mentioned some of the kinds of state laws that um, really uh, have uh, have made a huge difference and, and are a major movement. And these are some of the kinds of state policies and laws, some of which have um, come into fruition through legislation, some of which have come into fruition through executive order. And some of them are not just procedural, but substantive. And I would argue the New Jersey law um, on cumulative impacts, which doesn't just require that cumulative impacts be taken into consideration, but actually, if there are cumulative impacts of, of a permit, when you, when you count the other insults to the community in that area, um, the state has to say no to that permit, to that new permit or that expansion. And so the idea here is emissions reduction. We're seeing just a, a, a flourishing of state environmental justice laws. We also engage students in communications. And I, I wanna make a plea to students um, uh, not only in Maine, but across the country, get involved in any way that your expertise can help, whether it's litigation, whether it's legislation. We have this clinic com uh, conversations blog series, lifting up the voices of some of our heroes and partners. Um, and I, I welcome, if you, if you go to Vermont Law School's website, you can see some of these conversations. Um, I didn't want to stop without mentioning climate justice. I think other people will talk more and again, happy to talk more about climate justice. But similarly, it moves away from thinking only about climate justice as what's happening to the earth or the melting ice caps. And of course, what's happening to species and uh, the earth as we know it and love it, but also what's happening to the most vulnerable populations. 
And in our clinic, we're tackling climate justice through interdisciplinary action, which includes petitions for rulemaking and, and the kind of array of activities that I was talking about before. So that's a, a quick outline of some of the ways in which students can be involved and that we're involved in trying to support communities in their pursuit of justice. Thanks. I'm going to uh, take this off. Thank you so much, Professor Engelman Lotto. We will now hear from Dr. Danny Faber. Okay. So, welcome everybody. I'm, let me load this up very quickly. Uh, oops. Um, so, uh, I'd like to again thank the organizers for uh, um, having me here. It's a real honor to be on such a distinguished panel uh, for whom I have so much respect. Um, so again, thank you for having me. A little bit about my background. Uh, I've been doing environmental justice work now for four decades. It started in the early 1980s when I formed the Environmental Project on Central America that was based at the Earth Island Institute. And we were working with popular movements, campesino organizations, the Solidarity Movement, and the human rights community to create an environmental justice network in Central America and to support the initiatives for revolutionary ecology in Nicaragua after the overthrow of the Somoza dictatorship and throughout uh, the, the entire Central American region. And uh, we were really quite successful with that. And uh, going on into the early 2000s, I began working with the leadership of the environmental justice movement in the United States, including the Indigenous Environmental Network, Southwest Network for Economic Environmental Justice, the Farm Worker Network for um, environmental justice around expanding the funding base of the movement. I did a report called Green of Another Color, which showed that the environmental justice movement is the most underfunded social movement in the United States. And it's another manifestation of environmental racism in the ways in which foundations were neglecting to fund the organizations doing the actual work in communities of color, low income communities, instead diverting monies to organizations that were grounded in those communities. So we were working to expand the funding base for the movement um, over a five, six year period. I think we were successful in moving quite a bit of money to help build up the capacity of the movement. And more recently, I worked with uh, in Massachusetts to help draft and uh, design the environmental justice policy and the executive order on environmental justice that was adopted here in Massachusetts by Governor Patrick. I've done a number of the EJ studies that uh, Professor Torres was talking about here in Massachusetts. And uh, then more recently, I've helped design the environmental justice platform for certain presidential candidates and uh, doing more work now around the Global Center for Climate Justice. So I'm gonna bring in some of those experiences all about what I wanna to talk today, which is namely what I see as a major paradox, which is currently confronting the environmental movement in the United States, which is namely this, that even over the last 40 decades, the US environmental movement has emerged as perhaps one of the most powerful social movements in this country's history. 40 million Americans belong to some 10,000 organizations and 75% of the American people believe that we should protect the environment and the government needs to do more to pr protect the environment and the climate. That despite these obvious strengths of the movement, the movement has failed to arrest the ecological crisis and in many ways it's getting worse. And so this means that we need to reflect and examine the strategies that have been adopted by the movement and why it's not working. The, the movement has failed to uh, achieve its primary goal, even though there's been significant uh, victories and improvements, the overall state of the ecological crisis is getting worse. So we can speak of a crisis of a liberal regime of environmental regulation that is not arresting the ecological crisis. We can see this with the growing chemicalization of our everyday environment. Recent studies have shown that chemical contamination is getting worse, toxic trespass, if you will, into our bodies. Centers for Disease Control has found that, in fact, babies are born pre-polluted. There's an average of some 200 different toxic chemicals that are found in, uh, in babies in the United States, as well as 
the general population as a whole. And that's contributing to cancer epidemic, which kills about 500 Americans, 500,000 Americans each and every year. One of every two men and one of every three women will get cancer in their lifetime. Now it kills more children than any other disease for the first time in US history. And of course, there is the existential threat posed by climate change. We now face a planetary emergency with the climate crisis. Um, the fossil fuel industry sits on $17 trillion of known fossil fuel assets. If they burn these known assets, um, they will take us five times beyond what the scientific community says is safe. And by the end of the century, we will live in a world that is about 11 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. And to pursue this agenda, there, um, we've entered this era of extreme energy where as conventional sources of energy have been depleted, the industry is now going to more extreme versions of extraction, ever more ecologically precarious in nature, ever more destructive. And that's resulted in the various assaults on indigenous rights as we've seen the struggles around the Dakota pipeline, Transamerica uh, pipeline and others. Um, and so uh, this era of deep energy where the destruction of fossil fuels in, a, in an effort to extract um, fuels from hell instead of fuels from heaven is leading to the current ecological crisis. And we now have the 10 hottest years on record globally. 2020 is looking to be the hottest yet. And we just had the hottest September ever recorded in the history of humanity globally. And so, of course, this was referred to uh, previously uh, about the notion of vulnerability, the way in which vulnerability is particularly um, to vulnerability to climate change is particularly um, impactful for those that lack the political, economic power in society to cope with climate change, which is primarily low income communities and communities of color throughout the United States and throughout the world. And one manifestation we're going to hear about this is the projections around um, the growing displacement of people around the world. I've written a report on this as well. The British government has estimated that 200 people might be displaced by climate change by year 2050. We can now consider this to be a relatively conservative estimate given that the projections on the impacts of climate change have intensified. Some studies have gone as high as a billion people or more and what will likely be uh, displaced by climate change um, over the course of this century. So the crisis of environmentalism, traditional environmental policy has evoked two political reactions. On the right, we see the rise of what I consider an oxymoron versus free market environmentalism, but also a growing power, cons consolidation of power in the hands of what I call a polluter industrial complex, which is the manner in which major corporate polluters over the last 30 years have organized a very sophisticated, sophisticated network of think tanks and policy institutes and research centers that are dedicated to uh, tackling uh, the environmental movement, environmental justice movements to convince us that climate change is not real. And um, they are funding candidates and they are funding propaganda campaigns and to the tunes of billions of dollars. And we are now seeing one of the most significant attacks and rollbacks of environmental policy that this country has ever seen under the Trump administration. And here's a celebration of many of the regulatory rollbacks that we've seen instituted under this administration. And one example of this attack um, is that there are about 140 foundations in the United States that are funded by the oil and gas industry that have given $558 million to 91 organizations that are committed to convincing the American people that climate change and climate justice are not real. Um, and that most of this money is now dark money that you can't really trace it. What I really wanna talk about now is the political reaction that's occurring on the left, which is the environmental justice critique. And this critique is namely goes along the lines that look, traditional environmental policy the liberal regime of environmental regulation that was created during the so-called decade of the environmental, uh, environmental decade of the 1970s is inadequate. It takes a single issue oriented approach for the most part to what are very complex and interrelated problems. It divorces issues of social and economic justice from environmental problem solving. 
It relies heavily on a flawed science of risk assessment and cost benefit analyses. But more importantly, in many ways, by attacking a general problem, it served to displace that problem increasingly onto communities that lack the political economic power to resist. So if ocean dumping was banned in 1988, which is good in terms of sewage sludge from New York City, but if New York City loads up thousands of railroad cars each and every month and transports those thousands of miles across country and deposits them in communities like Sierra Blanca, Texas, which is 80% Hispanic, 50% of the population lives below the poverty line, then they become the repositories for this toxic sewage sludge from New York City. And when George Bush was governor in the state of Texas, he created 200 such sites in the state of Texas, every one of them in a low income community of color. So as toxics and other types of environmental hazards become commodified and become increasingly mobile as a result of environmental regulation, they are increasingly being transported to distances far from where they're produced and displaced onto people who lack the political economic power to resist. And that is particularly communities of color. And therefore, it's no accident that we've seen a tremendous growth in the rise of the environmental justice movement over the last three or four decades as pollution becomes increasingly commodified and mobile in this manner. Um, and we can think of the environmental justice movement in the United States as being a convergence of seven formerly independent social movements that have struggled for civil rights as Professor Torres was mentioning, Martin Luther King's struggle in the garbage, uh, uh, around the garbage strike in Memphis, but also around farm worker rights, uh, particularly with regard to pesticides, indigenous land rights, uh, going back to the Uran uh, uranium mining and other struggles in Hopi Navajo land over, over coal mining, the solidarity movement and human rights struggles, not just around apartheid in South Africa, but also Central America, as well as India, and the environmental health movement, Dana Alston and many key environmental justice activists actually came out of the environmental health movement, which they perceived as not giving enough attention to communities of color. The immigrant rights movement, um, particularly in places like Detroit and so forth, is gaining momentum. And finally, the climate justice movement. So in many ways, we can speak of environmental justice not necessarily as a holistic movement, but as many different movements that comes together and articulates in many different ways. Um, so I think the, the key point I want to make here is that increasingly capital as it becomes mobile is targeting communities that lack the political economic power for the society and environmentally hazardous facilities. A really classic example of this would be in California, where the state was having great difficulty a few years back getting communities to accept the siting of incinerators. And for good reason, because dioxins, heavy metals, some super toxics are what come out of the incinerators of these incinerators, and um, no one wants to be near them. So they hire Sorrell Associates to help them figure out a solution to this um, dilemma. And on page 41 of the report, they conclude under no such circumstances should such a facility be built within a five mile radius of a white middle class community because of the greater likelihood of encountering political opposition. Instead, the, the state should target uh, Catholic communities, low-income communities, rural communities. And they go on and they, they talk about this and they nowhere do they recommend citing these where their public health impact would be minimized. Where are the optimum geologic, geographic, or climactic conditions? It was solely in terms of the ability of a community to offer political opposition. Similar study was produced with regard to nuclear waste in the state of North Carolina. Again, they recommended depositing nuclear waste in communities that lack the capacity to mobilize. So going back to California, after the report was issued by Sorrell Associates, some 17 incinerators were built in the city of Los Angeles. Every single one of them was located in a low income community of color. 91% of the population living within the high impact zone of these incinerators, which is less than two miles, were people of color. And this is not unique to California, same with Chicago, seven incinerators built in African-American communities, two in white working class communities. My home state of Massachusetts, four incinerators were built in a 12 square mile area of downtown Lawrence, which is the poorest community in the state. Um, it was a community of, of, of color 
we're undergoing process of what we call so, uh, churning in the field of sociology, where you had a lot of new immigrant populations moving in. They spoke different languages. They came from different backgrounds. It was very difficult for them to form solidarity with one another and speak with one voice. The community was deeply fragmented by race, class, ethnicity, and national origin, as well as language. A huge portion of the population did not speak English as their first language. So each one of these incinerators was emitting over 2,000 pounds of mercury each into the environment each and every year. The Biodiversity Institute has done a study and they found the highest levels of mercury in the entire eastern United States in the environment is in the Merrimack Valley around uh, Lawrence. So we, if we stand back and think about this for a second in terms of the political economy of environmental justice, there's always an incentive on behalf of corporations to minimize the cost of production and often they can do that by displacing cost onto the larger public in the form of what are called negative externalities. And it typically doesn't pay industry to invest in pollution control equipment because it doesn't increase productivity or profits. It's just treated as an unproductive expenditure or a cost. But the key point I'm trying to make here is that when you choose to uh, displace harm onto the public, that is an antisocial act. And so what has come up for me in my studies time after time after time is that industry will often choose to displace costs on the environment, which are not necessarily the most profitable or the most cost effective, but are the most politically expedient. That capital will continually choose the path of least resistance for the displacement of harm onto the public. And so what that means is that what is really fundamentally important here is the balance of power that exists between the state, these private corporations, particularly heavily polluting corporations, and the larger public. Anytime we are polluted, this is the most fundamental violation of our basic rights as citizens to clean water, clean air, and clean environment. And whenever you see a corporation knowingly polluting a community and causing harm, that is symptomatic of a larger crisis of a democracy, a lack of respect for our most fundamental, basic civil and human rights. And so therefore, it's no accident that the communities that have the least amount of political power, where there is the least respect for civil and human rights, are the ones that are increasingly being dumped on. For the first time ever in American history, in public opinion polls of Latino communities show that the number one concern now is pollution in uh, Latino communities. It has passed immigration as the uh, most important issue. Climate change, interestingly enough, is number three. This is a study I did here. Dr. Faber? Yep, yeah. two minutes. Uh, as requested, yes, as requested, we're at the two minute mark. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Josh. So I did this study real quickly in Massachusetts and I just wanna show you this. Um, we looked at everything, but uh, this is one uh, picking up what uh, Professor Torres talked about. We were looking at where were all the toxic waste sites located in Massachusetts. And what you find is predominantly white communities. There was an average of two hazardous waste sites per square mile. And communities of color, there was an average of 48 hazardous waste sites per square mile. You don't often see this in the social sciences, but it's a one-to-one -one correlation. As a community becomes more racially diverse, there is a direct and corresponding increase in the frequency of hazardous waste sites. Without question, it's not even close. Race is by far the most important predictor of the frequency of hazardous waste sites that exist in any community. So what I've been doing a lot of work with lately uh, with Coming Clean, I'm on the governing board of Coming Clean, and it's a coalition of about 200 different organizations in the United States, ranging from anti-fracking groups, the Environmental Justice Health Alliance, Richard Moore is also on our board, is the founder of the Southwest Network for Economic and Environmental Justice. Greenpeace and many other organizations. And what we are working for is what would constitute a more transformative and restorative approach to environmental justice. The goal of the environmental justice movement should not to be ensure, not should only not be to ensure that all people are polluted equally. That's a bad bumper sticker. It doesn't make for a great slogan. The goal of the environmental justice movement is not to ensure that all people are polluted equally. It's to work for a politics where no one be polluted at all. 
And that means not in my backyard, it means not in anyone's backyard. And that means in inventing a more transformative environmental justice politics, which goes to the root causes of the ecological crisis so that we can arrest the production of ecological hazards in the first place. And that's what we've been doing, for example, around chemicals policy in working for legislation here in, Man in Massachusetts that would mandate the phase out of toxic chemicals and their replacement with safer substitutes. So building this would mean sublating the traditional identity politics that you see in the EJ movement that highlights cultural oppression, bringing together radical democratic politics, which is focused on political domination, the denial of political, legal and political rights, as well as a socialist politics, which is focused on class and economic exploitation, sublating them into a richer conception of environmental justice so that we can build a mass-based environmental justice movement, a mass-based climate justice movement, which is capable of taking on the most powerful corporations which have colonized our government and developing a new agenda which can infuse issues of social and economic justice with environmental protection. And finally, I think this is one of the promises of a Green New Deal, that if in so doing that we can create a vision of how working for climate justice, working for environmental justice can lead to the creation of a better society, perhaps the best society that this country has ever seen. And so rather than people retreating in the face of an overwhelming climate crisis, an overwhelming planetary ecological crisis, they can be inspired to become part of a movement that can bring about a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Faber. We will now hear from Professor Maxine Burkett. Great, thank you everyone. This is a, it's such a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to uh, speak after all of these excellent panelists. I think this is um, flowing beautifully in that what I will be talking about really relates uh, a lot to what uh, we just heard from Professor Faber. And I, I, uh, I've been tasked with talking about uh, climate justice and some of my work on climate related migration, but also the question of whether or not our legal systems will prevail in light of the climate reality and try to sort of provide some reflection on what we've been hearing this afternoon or my time this evening for all of you and some of the key takeaways. And so I'll go ahead and share my screen as well um, and give a little bit of context of what I'll be talking about. Um, so I'm taking a little bit more of a global perspective, but I think it's easily translated to the context of the United States. We see familiar patterns repeat at all scales. The disproportionate burdens of climate change borne by the global South or the poor and of color are numerous and uh, increasingly well do documented. And while the disproportionate effects of the climate crisis are starting to receive, I think, due media coverage in the current moment of heightened awareness, the centuries-long relationship between environmental degradation and racial hierarchy also deserves deeper exploration, particularly to ensure that our solutions seek to grasp at the roots of the crisis while it sort of prunes the branches. So indeed, I, uh, if we look back, the climate crisis and racial hierarchy have long been inextricably intertwined, explaining in large part the uneven share and cause and consequence of the global North and South vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate, as well as uh, BIPOC communities in the United States. Decision makers have generally favored low-hanging fruit in our problem solving, yet at the roots, we find the origins of both dangerously cabin views of what our environment is and what it entails, for which EJ has a more, I think, expansive um, understanding, and a political economy that has relied on sacrificing land and people, as Professor Torres referenced in terms of sacrifice zones, and furtherance of sort of myopic understandings of progress. So here's what I'll do with my time, the balance of my time. Uh, first, I'm going to use the lens of uh, a climate migration, more commonly referred to as the climate re refugee crisis, and discuss climate justice um, in relationship to the migration crises as illustrated in maps, uh, images, and graphics, which I think all together tell a vivid story of the root issues. I'll then consider if our legal systems beyond just environmental law are capable of responding adequately, especially when they might be de deeply implicated in perpetuating these crises. I'll take a very quick detour to summarize the rationale for climate reparations, which I've been doing in part 
with the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice and talk about this guarantee of non-repetition because I, I believe it's essential to getting at the roots. And then I'll uh, sort of close with an exploration of what getting at the roots looks like uh, as we look in the rear view, but while we are uh, especially concerned with contemplating and building towards preferred futures. So first, uh, mapping climate change and climate justice. There are uh, a few statements by, by physical scientists that, I, that tell the geogra geophysical story, but often lay bare the geopolitical dilemmas. When I first read this uh, years ago, Sir David King was referencing the glacier melt in Greenland, uh, and he said the maps of the world will have to be re redrawn. But this has much larger meaning as we've organized ourselves in the geopolitical landscape. And because of changes to this landscape, more may be forced to move. Uh, we know that climate change uh, interacts with this map, but this is the one that we've created and becomes quite relevant to us because those borders and jurisdiction make movement more difficult within countries, but also across borders especially. And they also affect our ability to even mitigate the crisis because of the sort of reinforced notion that borders meaningfully define or delimit national interests when it comes to a global crisis. Uh, again, climate change is indifferent when it comes to the political map. Regarding equity considerations and climate justice and uh, that's relevant at all scales, again, we see uh, maps like this that tell the story of the climate crisis and the history of, of differential use of our, our commons, right? This map is distorted based on emissions at a given time, 2009. Certain countries are dwarfed by entire continents. I wanna draw your attention to the right of the screen too, where the Pacific itself is almost um, uh, indecipherable amongst all of those larger larger circles. Now, this was a time where China eclipsed the US in terms of annual carbon dioxide emissions, but we see historically that we are a big part of the, uh, the contribution in terms of CO2 emissions uh, singularly. And to find island nations in particular, you'd have to look to that 17% that encompasses the rest of the world of which uh, the small islands are the tiniest uh, sliver. Another uh, graphic that's important and I think tells the climate justice stories is per capita emissions for the top 10 emitters. Now, there are at least 180 some other countries not depicted on this map. So if you're sitting in your room, imagine this, this, uh, this graph circling back around you um, in your room and you will find the tiny country of the Republic of the Marshall Islands all the way down at the end. All right, the per capita emissions are negligible. Yet what we know about this uh, island nation is that it's uniquely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and migration in particular. And this is of particular interest to us here in Hawaii as we're already a host and transition state for Pacific Islanders who are moving to the US for a myriad compelling reasons. Now, we know that there are other non-climate change related dynamics to understand this, uh, this red spot in the Western Pacific. Um, we're also learning that the drowning islands narrative may be the least accurate in the near term and thirsty or extremely hot island narratives are perhaps more on point. Yet we might see this as a preview of things to come made unambiguous by media coverage like this. You're making this island disappear. While climate forecasters deem small islanders as among the most vulnerable to climate change impacts, a subset of small islanders like the Marshallese also face the specter of permanent loss of habitable state territory, rendering them migrants without a home country. The media is also starting to take notice of climate figure prints uh, in other migration stories. Um, consider the migrant caravan debacle. Uh, we saw that there were an, uh, some, uh, some coverage, there was some coverage in the sort of uh, tsunami of coverage around this uh, migrant caravan um, political crisis uh, that looked at some of the climate change fingerprints in that phenomenon. And there was even an above the fold article in the New York Times that talked about uh, the, the role of climate change and what it's doing and how it's serving as a tipping point, right? Here we see a farmer that's quoted saying, the weather is crazy everything's out of control. Climate change is a different kind of driver, uh, even if we understand migration as a multi-causal event. In the context of a change in climate, this is a completely new phenomenon. And interestingly, at this point, climate change is presented as a tipping point. But already today's tip 
can have profound consequences if you consider the relative numbers against the backdrop of our existing legal arrangements. It's important to think back to the 2015-2016 period of, of migrant flows um, that really upended the politics of, <laughs> of the West, right? The European continent, Australia, and, and the United States. At the time, the migrant flows constituted 0.2% of each of the populations of the EU and Australia, and only 0.02% of the population of the United States. Yet throughout the globe, decision makers are conducting high stakes debates on border control with xenophobic undercurrents, uh, sometimes quite overt in fact, but they're not understanding a key variable. And we've, uh, we've sort of cabined the ability to talk about this, right? Is this predominantly an integration issue, an environmental issue, a climate issue, a national security concern, one of equity and justice? Uh, of course, it seems that it's all of those things, but of course, if it has a climate element to it, it's, uh, it's meant to be dealt with in the environmental space uh, uh, solely. It's also further complicated by the fact that there are numerous categories uh, and there are numerous institutions that could be responsible for this. Right? There are many areas of law that can own this particular issue of migration, uh, climate-induced as well. And Professor Williams, William Busby, who's a, a Bill Busby's environmental law professor, he's described this kind of phenomenon as a regulatory commons problem. He says, in essence, that though a social ill is widely recognized, the very existence of multiple potential managers prevents any one player from taking responsibility. And this is especially true when the causes and harms of that ill cross jurisdictional and or uh, state boundaries. And because of its cross-cutting nature, particularly into fields that don't understand themselves to be environmental, the ill can continue to evade focused attention because no one policy community is obliged to respond. And in fact, uh, and more so, no, climate migrants can't hold anyone accountable for failures to respond. So how does the legal system in its entirety keep up with this? Uh, I have a, a, some colleagues who work in systems thinking, and they have this sort of uh, test of what capabilities a system needs in order to be deemed as vibrant and resilient. And I thought this is an excellent way to think about whether the legal system itself uh, is resilient and vibrant, right? Is, does it see itself as complex? I, again, speaking generally about the entirety of it, is it able to make meaning or sense of challenges? Is it able to align around the next best action? Is it able to test or prototype learn and adapt? It seems to me that um, it's not clear what, that the answer is yes to those. And it's also important to consider that it's, it's plausible, if not probable, that the global, uh, the global climate will experience a more than three degrees Celsius temperature increase and possibly five degrees by 2081. Right now, the state we're in with fire natos, with uh, you know, sort of a conveyor belt of hurricanes on the Gulf Coast, with heat waves, Siberia was hotter than Honolulu for much of the June uh, period. This is 1.1 degrees Celsius above average. So if we imagine a three degree increase and then a five degree increase, we're literally uh, contemplating a whole new world. And few appreciate the enormity of the task to respond to no analog events like large scale climate induced migration. And worse still, I think from the perspective of the legal system is that we expect environmental law to do all of the work. Why and, and how can it? This is an increasing change as well as an increase in the rate of change. And I argue that a similar change and increase in the rate of change is needed for the legal system in its entirety, if only to keep pace and certainly to have a fighting chance to, uh, to reach just outcomes. And so the shift doesn't necessarily require better environmental law. It requires a whole new thinking about some of those root issues, some of those root structures in our socio-legal systems. So I want to say uh, uh, quickly on miracles and theories of justice that um, I think we're about here, right? This is where we seem to be. I, this is one of my favorite New York car cartoons. There's a complex problem and we know there are complex solutions involved and we're sort of relying on a, on a miracle. We seem to be contemplating systemic transformations, intentional or climate induced, by relying on some kind of miracle that we're yet to identify. And few effects of climate uh, change itself demonstrate that more than the disarray that might result from climate-induced displacement, migration, and relocation. Climate migration presents novel legal issues, such as the kind of 21st century statelessness that the Marshallese must contemplate. It also provokes all of the unfinished work of our current legal regimes, as mentioned by the previous panelists, namely power, whether power from fossil fuel derived electrons to uneven heft at negotiations tables, and historical contributions to both climate change and other communities or countries' vulnerability to it. 
Further, there are major components of our legal infrastructure that have gotten us here and support continued paralysis. And climate justice as a maturing field of law and legal theory, I think has a lot to say about this. Uh, Professor Anna Greer, for example, analyzes law's structural complicity in the uneven outcomes and forecasts for the poor and of color globally. She notes that the very design of the law, particularly corporate law and, and international trade law, is fundamentally predisposed to environmental degradation. Marcus uh, Hedall, uh, describes, among other things, that, that in the, there's an inability to clearly articulate duties or obligations in response to identifiable rights, and that's a wrong in and of itself. Climate justice is also starting to leverage other relevant critiques, such as uh, Professor Ramji Nagalis's uh, uh, argument against migration law. And her critique there is that, um, the, that the migration law actively creates refugee crises by the law's own parameters. And it does this uh, by, for example, requiring that migrants access the state's territory to appeal for refugee status, embarking on more than likely a risky and perhaps extra legal or illegal journey. And she further demonstrates that the crisis is created by the existing legal system and its infrastructure choices. It's not a crisis of absolute capacity given the relative size of cross-border migrant flows, which I mentioned earlier. Now, um, for that, for that quick detour, which I think is actually getting to this, this, uh, this in, in, critical in, in between, uh, I've been a part of a, a process of trying to understand um, how we got here, correcting for that and ensuring that it's not repeated. And that, that process can guide us through that step from complex problem to complex solutions and the just and equitable, equitable futures we prefer to see. The uh, Lancet Commission, which I mentioned, is looking at reparations and redistributive justice to figure out how we can uh, investigate and understand current uneven outcomes and then repair for those in ways that are appropriate that, again, get at the root. Now, specific harms, as I mentioned, are getting their uh, due attention uh, and deserve more. This is the experience of heat that's uneven across the globe and certainly true in our own country in which we see histories of redlining have a very long tail in terms of impact and spikes in, in temperature and heat extremes. We also know that if we look uh, further back, we can see that the story is even older than that. The racial hierarchy and environmental disruption have been what I'd argue, mutual accelerants, right? And that is true as early as the 15th century. Here we're seeing research where uh, researchers concluded what, that the, what they call the great dying of indigenous peoples of the Americas resulted in a human-driven global impact on Earth systems in the two centuries prior to the Industrial Revolution. So climate reparations is looking at reparations for the concerns of the most vulnerable. The most important prong there is how do we not repeat the offending act? What does non-repetition look like in this context? For climate change, that's an extraordinary question, right, in the literal sense of the word, because more than repairing or compensating for past harms, it asks for us to really understand the foundational faults in uh, contemporary life. I've argued in a few pieces that this is a critical uh, element, that we need to go to the actual underlying needs of vulnerable communities in developing countries. And the question becomes, how can we look to the past, yet remain forward thinking and acting at this critical time? So. Root and branch, right? To guarantee non-repetition, the answer is not simply don't use fossil fuels again. As incredibly important as that is, right? Uh, I think the diagnosis involves an investigation of root causes, which scholars such as Anna Greer, Aaron Sad, Stephen Humphreys, Carmen Gonzalez uh, have explored. In the context of the larger divide that has defined rich and poor, the global North and South, the West and everyone else, uh, thinkers like uh, Economic anthropologist Jason Hickel, for example, also has provided a critical through line, pardon me. And he says here, um, he looks at the impacts of enslavement, colonialism, their aftermath, and it and underscores how a small cohort have grown uh, through accessing much greater resources, right? Whether they're human or natural bodies. And he reminds the reader in this book, this really excellent book I highly recommend, that in the year 1500, there was no appreciable difference in the incomes and living standards between Europe and the rest of the world. The divide between rich countries and poor countries isn't natural or inevitable, same for the communities within our country, but they were the result of uh, colonial exploits, right, with devastating knock-on effects for those peoples and places that were colonized, followed by structural adjustment, followed by our notions of aid. In this particular piece, he's saying, look, in 2012, the aid, for example, that we gave to developing countries totaled $2 trillion, but some $5 trillion flowed out of the global south in the same year. 
under legal forms of debt payment, foreign investor profits, payment to foreign patent owners, capital flight, et cetera. And so he wants to upend the charity paradigm, which obscures the real issues at stake. It makes it seem as though the West is developing the global South, when in reality, the opposite is true. Rich countries aren't developing poor countries, poor countries are developing rich countries, and they have been since the late 15th century. And I think that same kind of subsidization is happening within our own country. In short, Hickel is saying, poor countries don't need our aid, they need us to stop impoverishing them. And we've seen evidence that the same can be said for poor communities in our country. He also says that anthropologists tell us that when the structure of a core myth begins to change, everything else about society changes around it and fresh new possibilities open up that weren't even think of, thinkable. Another myth that is that we are, are there, that's at root is that our fortune is not inextricably interlinked with the living planet as been mentioned. There's a dualism reflected in our perceived distance from nature, but it's cleverly rebuffed by what I think is a hopeful sign from our youth climate stri strikers. The law reflects though that preference for clear domains, which hinders effective responses to systemic challenges like structural racism or environmental change. Klaus Bosselman describes this as the compartmentalization and fragmentation of the law. Uh, compartmentalization refers to the conceptual isolation of the environment from other policy areas. And he describes its typical effects on decision-making and education. There's the uh, EPA, uh, but it's the treasury that determines public policy. There are environmental laws, but they're isolated from commercial laws that are more impactful on the places where we live, work, and play. And there are law schools with environmental law programs, yet 80% of the curriculum has no environmental component at all. In short, the root causes, I would say, are the collision of this dualism and racial subjugation. Climate change requires the sacrifice zones that Professor Torres has noted, and sacrifice zones require this kind of racial hierarchy. So uh, I know I'm, uh, I'm coming close to the end of my time, and I just want to build on uh, this: the, the tendency in climate talks, obviously, is to uh, you know end on a hopeful note. And I don't have pictures of windmills or fast fields, vast fields of solar arrays in this presentation, though I think again that's important. Instead, I want to highlight the intellectual technology also that already exists, right? There are alternative paradigms. There are numerous rights discourses and critical legal theories that have highlighted these inequities and forwarded elegant and longstanding alternatives. The principles that are the most just for the worst off, including the non-human natural world, are embraced and articulated by these literatures on tra traditional knowledge and indigenous legal orders, earth jurisprudence and environmental justice. And while these discourses may appear a radical departure from the current socio-legal structures, they may nonetheless be mandated by those seeking justice in our climate constrained world. Bill McKibben said this in response to the uh, getting arrested uh, and uh, for, for climate protests. And he said, you know, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> the end of the world is the end of the world. And I offer you this because oftentimes my proposals for getting to the root are met with hesitation or disbelief. But honestly, I think the alternative is much more difficult. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Burkett. We will now begin the Q&A portion of our event, moderated by Professor Jeff Thaler. If you have not already done so, please submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A portal. Thanks very much, Allison. And I want to, again, really um, extend a lot of thanks to our panel. And I know that uh, Dean Softley extended that at the beginning. Um, I'm really thrilled with everybody who accepted this. And I have to say, I'm jealous of all the clinics and everything else that we've heard about because I know at Maine Law School, we're a small law school, one of the smallest in the country, but we wanna have a big impact. And we wanna do that through not just studying about these issues, but acting on them as well. And I think everybody who's on this webinar tonight, over 200 people, uh, have a passion for this and, and know that how important it is. So I'm gonna, I wanna start off with a couple questions from myself to try to pull things together and then open it up to everybody. And so I hope people will submit questions so that I as a professor don't have to cold call people in the audience because we know professors are good at that. But I have to start off by saying that uh, Professor Torres and I were law school classmates and housemates. So I have to ask him whether Gerald, when you were a student at Yale Law School, could you ever envision yourself going back and being a professor there? Uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, I didn't envision myself being a professor, period, right? So, so being a professor at, at, at Yale Law School, um, 
I'm not going to say it never occurred to me, but it wasn't a, a clear vision. Let me put it that way. And remember, I mean, what what did we did we have? We had one environmental law course. At, at, at yeah, there was not much. Yeah, right, right. And I didn't take it. I don't know if you did. <laughs> uh, no, I did not take it. <laughs> there we go. Um, I wanted to um, start off with a question in terms of. Um, I think you've all talked about the importance of these issues, and I want to tee it back up to something that was said early on in terms of, uh, we have a lot of students, uh, both law students and otherwise, on this webinar tonight. And there's a really good book for people if you haven't seen it, um, Environmental Justice, and there's a number of environmental justice books. This one is has... Um, a number of short pieces in it. I think Professor Burkett's got one in it and several of our other panelists are referenced in it. But in the foreword is, is a passage I wanna just quickly read aloud and then ask the panelists whoever wanna to respond to it, to respond to it. And it, it is this, and it's by Mustafa Santiago Ali, who is at the National Wildlife Federation and is I think vice president for environmental and climate justice issues there. And it is at a, and this is dated 2020, by the way. Um, at a time when science is under attack and policy is being manipulated, the law has become our greatest defense against the erosion of our civil, human, and environmental rights. The law is also our greatest weapon to ensure that our most vulnerable are truly protected. We need men and women of good conscience to stand up but they must be prepared with the tools to fight injustice of both the past and the present. I'm confident that one day, the not so distant future, we will have a society where all communities will be able to breathe clean air and drink clean water. Um, how, would you, how would you respond to that? Any of you? Well, I, I, I wanna take people back to 1970, okay? Because remember, in 1970, in what was then and may still be right, the, the largest single popular mobilization in American history, right, Earth Day occurred. Right? And what Earth Day did is it, 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 it brought people together to talk about environmental protection and, in fact, launched, uh, uh, in many ways, the regulatory infrastructure that we think of as environmental law today. The environmental justice movement, which uh, uh, everyone has talked about today, is actually, in my view, the motor at this point of uh, uh, the transformation of environmental regulatory, environmental regulatory structure. And it, it, it's a deeper critique in some ways because it, 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 it not only locates us right, in a set of natural systems, but it suggests that the, the, the as Professor Burkett pointed out, the, the, the social system we inhabit uh, is, is not natural, right? It's actually created by us. And if it's been created by us, then it can be transformed by us. But the, 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 the power of popular movement and popular mobilization is gonna be the thing that gives people who are in position to make uh, policy changes, the courage to pretend like it was their idea. Um, any, go ahead. Yeah, follow up on that. I, to, first of all, to recommend two other books. Um, one is Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, which uh, is really helpful in understanding the backdrop to this conversation and the role that law has played in creating segregation and um, and the kind of racial stratification we see to opportunity in this country. And the second is From the Ground Up by Cole and Foster, which, um, which uh, puts forward um, a theory of change that's rooted in individual transformation and social transformation that comes from um, all of us supporting communities um, transforming themselves rather than thinking that courts transform, make change or, or we make change. It is communities that make change and we can support that. And, and I mentioned both of those books because um, 
look, I went into the law, I went into civil rights law because of its potential. And I went to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which was the creation of Thurgood Marshall, um, who had this vision that he talked about uh, where the goal of the action was to bend the arc of the law toward justice. But the starting point is it doesn't approximate justice. The starting point is um, throughout American history, law has been a tool of, of oppressors. And what we try to do is bend that arc um, of the law toward justice. So it is, as uh, Gerald Torres has said, it is the potential. It is it, it can be in, in someone's hands a tool of oppression, and it can be in someone's hands the tool of moving that arc of the law toward justice and being able to enforce consistency, the rule of law, and, and change and, and equality. And that's, that's the question that's up to us, uh, no less in the area of the environment and environmental justice than in any other area. So just to drill into that, just for a quick second, one of the questions that we've received is from a, a state legislator here in Maine, Maggie O'Neill, and it is if you have any specific suggestions for action at the local or state levels um, that could be taken, regardless of whatever happens next week in Washington, for example, just hypothetically. I do. Um, I'll start and then let other people speak. As I mentioned briefly, states across the country have been moving forward on a whole range of, of really important um, state laws and actions, including making environmental justice the policy of the state, ensuring you have a language access policy, a public participation policy, creating these EJ mapping tools like Cal EnviroScreen in California, that then is followed by once you have the visualization of where the communities that are most vulnerable to issues of uh, climate change and also to environmental hazards, being able to target resources, target enforcement to those communities and, and, and prioritize them. Um, you know, obviously having little NEPAs is important, having EJ advisory boards so that uh, community members can uh, provide ongoing advice, ensuring public participation is strong. And there's so many really great models out there. New Jersey's cumulative impacts law is really important to, to bring down those, those uh, and reduce um, emissions in uh, areas that are dealing with cumulative impacts. Is any of these a cure-all? No. Uh, do all of these have mixed uh, results, like having an advisory board? You know, it could be sort of uh, whitewashing a problem. But uh, these are all components of change that, uh, that can be, be really powerful as well. Yeah, if I could jump in too, I'd like to say that, you know, I think the law is terribly important right now. It's one of the reasons we see such a concerted attack on the courts. Um, and it's a very sophisticated and uh, in-depth attack that we're seeing on the legal system right now. But I, I also want us to think a little bit about the ways in which many of our current environmental laws serve to constrain the environmental justice movement. And that we kind of sometimes become trapped within its parameters. And I think it'd be a good time to think about what would constitute a more transformative environmental justice law and approach. I testify as an expert witness in EJ cases all the time here in Massachusetts, and we just lose, lose, lose. We hardly ever win a case because as long as the offending facility can demonstrate that they're meeting the permit requirements, then the state is very, very hesitant to deny a permit and the offending corporation can come in. And it, it doesn't matter if there's 50 or other, a uh, hundred other polluting facilities, if the individual firm makes its permit requirements, the state won't take action. So New Jersey was, I think, really important because here I can demonstrate cumulative impact and it just doesn't matter. The law doesn't allow for taking into the cumulative impacts borne by a community. So I think that's an avenue that really needs to be more fully developed. In the executive uh, order and the EJ policy here, there's language built in. If it can be demonstrated that there are elevated health problems 
related to environmental contamination in a community, it grants additional discretion to policymakers and to regulators to take action that would be normally considered out of bounds. But it allows them, it doesn't mandate it, it doesn't demand it. So we look at something like, for example, REACH in Europe. This to me was what would constitute a more transformative environmental justice politics. So in Europe, the burden is placed upon industry to prove that a chemical is safe before it can be introduced into the marketplace. In the United States, the burden is placed upon the public to prove that a chemical is dangerous after it's been introduced into the marketplace, which means you need a public health disaster, which we're seeing in communities of color, low-income communities throughout the United States. And even then, if you try to bring legal action, it's very, very difficult sometimes to prove harm in a court of law. It can be very, very expensive and very time-consuming. So i like us to think about how we can use the law to be more proactive rather than defensive. How can we sort of weaponize, you, if you will, the law so that it can be conducive to building a whole new regulatory regime uh, for environmental justice policy? So if I could, um, I, wanna, I wanna ask a question to follow up on that and I'd be interested Professor Burkett, we haven't heard from you, so you can un you un unmute yourself because I'm yeah. heading your way, but in part. But I was interested in one of your slides, you talked about poor countries essentially developing the rich countries, supporting the rich countries. And I was analogizing that in my head to poor communities, that's really the heart of environmental justice, are subsidizing or supporting rich communities by being the place where all these businesses are located. And when we talk about environmental justice, I don't think we've talked about it tonight, but I, I like the questions that are being asked about law versus not law. Mm -hmm. And in terms of law, there's pending in Congress right now, obviously won't be enacted this year, maybe it will be next year, the, the executive order that is the foundation of environmental justice in this country that Professor Torres was involved with is just an executive order. I mean, it's miraculous that it hasn't been revoked already by some of the subsequent presidents because it could be with the stroke of a pen, but it's still there, but it doesn't have the force of law. There's a bill in Congress, went through the House in the Senate called Environmental Justice for All. Senator Harris is the lead sponsor in the Senate. And in the definition of environmental justice in that bill, it, it talks about it along the lines that, that we've discussed in terms of impacts on people regardless of race, color, culture, national origin, or income. And, and it also talks about it in terms of policies to ensure that every person enjoys A, the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards, and then B, equal access to any federal agency on these issues to have a healthy environment to live, work, and recreate. And one thing we haven't talked about tonight, so I guess two questions are, A, if, again, hypothetically, depending on election results next week, um, that bill was able to advance and become law, what would it mean? But secondly, one thing we haven't talked about tonight is the pandemic. And, and the fact is that with COVID, the disproportionate number of people who have tested positive for COVID or died from it are people of color and minorities and people of low income. And is, is COVID, which is likely to continue in this country for a while, in my personal opinion, uh, another form of, of an environmental justice issue given its disproportionate impact on the same communities we're talking about? So Maxine, I'll, I'll let sure. you start. Yeah, happy to go first. I have a number of thoughts. I'll just say in short, yes, I think that, um, you know, COVID really hits at the reason why it's hard to create firm boundaries around what we consider environment and public health uh, and equity in those contexts, right? This is a, this, the, there's, there's direct overlap there. Um, I do want to kind of quickly go back to your 
first point, which is to say that, yes, I think fractal like what we're describing with poor countries at the global scale is happening in communities within the United States. And this is where I think Marianne's discussion was, you know, sort of right on, right on point there, which is to say that the excesses of wealthy communities or the eastern seaboard is being borne by communities in Alabama in a way that reflects what we're seeing globally. So we're seeing the same kinds of things happen. But it's really important when we're thinking about the appropriate legal responses and whether or not we create more law around it, that we sort of understand this, um, what we're seeing is epiphenomenal. In other words, what we saw with George Floyd and the racial crisis in our country that's been with us for centuries, um, dealing with cr the criminal justice system is just one way in which it manifests. Right? What we really need to be getting at is the entirety of the legal system that creates the conditions that also has people living uh, uh, the way we have been in the communities of color um, without adequate um, systemic responses. And so if we recognize that that is also true for um, environmental uh, uh, either burdens or benefits, then we have to understand the full system's impact and input there. And so a lot of what needs to happen is, again, what I say, what I say, what I think is really important now, um, having um, built on the incredibly important work that happened prior to and continues to happen alongside is that it's not just environmental law that has to think about the, the work that needs to be done, right? We have to investigate uh, corporate law. We have to be thinking about property law. We have to be thinking about these, you know, venerable forces, you know, sort of structures that don't, that sort of get a pass on, on this. Um, and as we build more environmental laws, is that going to help us if we still have these, uh, the, the capacity to, to make changes uh, in, in these other areas of law um, that are far more monumental in terms of their impact on people's well being? And we see this a lot. If I can just take us uh, very quickly to the environmental context, we see this a lot in recent examples of trying to build out sound international environmental law to respond to climate change. But it's actually doing that while international trade sort of continues to do over work over here that, again, is you know speeding us along to the cliff, if you will, um, in terms of, of hitting our emissions. So if we don't sort of audit, if we don't look at what that, that side of the law is doing and the fact that we could build as much as we want to in terms of the environmental uh, it, justice, even infrastructure, if we don't look there as well and do the good work of, of, in, of demanding less harm in our legal system, then I think we're going to always be in sort of a situation of an uphill climb. So that's what I would offer as a meta. A meta Gerald, question. since you were involved in the, the original environmental executive order um, and, and you've got the pending law, what, how, how can, I mean, it, what's the role for law going forward <laughs> and, and how much should there be more push from the outside, well, to, outside to, of law? Two, two things. Well, one, when, when we were drafting the executive order, the thing we did right, to put it together was to first meet with, with uh, uh, community environmental justice groups. And, and I sat and met, I can't even remember now, I, I should go to the archives and actually see if I can dig up the, the, the notes. But, but what, we, what we wanted was a full uh, description, not of what environmentalists would say environmental justice is, but what the people who are experienced it would say environmental justice requires. Yeah, and I'll, I'll remind you that one of our teachers, if I can play old home week here for a minute, right, uh, is said, you know, the, the moral worth of a society, law, law reflects but does not determine the moral worth of a society, right? In, uh, in, 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 in heaven, there will be no law and lions will lie down with the lamb. Right? In hell, there will be nothing but law and due process will be assiduously uh, observed. Right. And, and there's, there's, you know, there was, he say, he, uh, uh, Professor Gilmore said he, he said that just so he could get off the stage unharmed. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I suspect there's a little bit of, of truth to that. So the, the idea is you, you, you listen to the people who are affected, right? And, and that should be the, the driver, first of all. There's experts, obviously, and we need, we need experts, and I don't want to uh, demean expertise, but, but, but you, you listen to what is necessary and then you use law to, to craft it where, where you can. That's why Professor Engelman laid us a suggestion to go back to the question that was asked by the, the uh, um, uh, local uh, official earlier, right? The idea of uh, if, you pa if you were to pass the Environmental Justice for All Act, if you had already instituted the kind of mapping that Professor Engelman Leto uh, proposed, then you would have something that you could use to apply the, the law to. That is, you would have the state already uh, uh, making clear to the people 
where the burdens and how the burdens are, are distributed. Then you get to talk about what the solutions are, how you get the solutions. So, so you know, creating the tools to make the, the enforcement or implementation of the federal statute easier would be a really useful thing for local uh, officials to do. That's one. Now in, in, in LA, for example, and I'll just give one little example. Uh, the advancement project in LA took all of the, for LA County, used GIS systems to map where public health dollars flowed into the county down to the, the neighborhood level, right? So $350 million comes into LA County every year for public health. They could trace it down to the neighborhood level. That map then became a really useful political document. Right, so the, the, the county's getting three hundred fifty million dollars. How come my neighborhood doesn't get any? Right. So let me ask a question that it, it, it ties together a couple of the questions from um, members of the audience. I started as a trial lawyer. I love litigation. I love suing, and and I was just involved in a, a global climate litigation conference Friday night and Saturday, based out of China. And I guess my question, my question is this, one of them asked about Juliana and what happened there. And in the US it's standing and it's redressability is what knocked out Juliana. We now have, and this ties to a couple of the comments, we have cities and states suing fossil fuel companies and potentially banks for funding fossil fuel companies for damages. But again, those may be uphill battles. In the Netherlands, the Urgenda case against the Dutch government is the first case in which a court, Supreme Court, ordered the government to comply with goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But that was based on the European Union's Human Rights Act. So my question is, there was a question in the, in the Q&A about rights-based efforts, uh, litigation or otherwise. And I could see two ways of that. One would be nature rights based, you know, does sort of going back to the, the trees have standing, but it really relates somewhat to Julianne and the atmosphere and the public trust doctrine. But secondly, human rights. Um, could, does environmental justice potentially, could there be efforts or initiatives to make it more of a human rights based approach to things or as a supplement to some of the theories that lawyers and litigants and expert witnesses are are attempting to use to get maybe either past or over some of the obstacles that have been happening in litigation so far i will let other people speak as a as a form of confession and avoidance i've been an advisor both to the juliana case and to the ongoing cases in the uh, in state court uh, all around the country. Um, the, the, the one legal tactic you should notice, right, is the attempt to remove the things from state court into federal court and the effort to, to resist that. It's not for no reason that they want to remove it to, to, to uh, f federal court, but I'll, I'll let other people talk or oh, answer. Your Anybody else want to tackle that on the panel? I'll give a... a, a, a roundabout answer and let other people answer you directly. Um, starting with your last question about the EJ executive order, all the, we have some tools at our disposal, whether it's civil rights, whether it's international human rights. I mean, people have been submitting um, uh, cases, um, human rights reports, shadow reports under uh, human rights conventions already making arguments. Um, we have lots of sort of starting points. Would it be useful if the EJ for All Act or the Environmental Justice Act of 2019, which would both codify the EJ executive order are passed? Absolutely. Um, should we strengthen our laws? Should we test them in court where uh, in a way that's calculated to make a change? Absolutely. Um, but they also need to be enforced. They also need to be given meaning. These are all, uh, you know, again, I, I want to go back to the theory of change. It's not that we don't have rights. It's not whether it's under human rights or civil rights or environmental law. Uh, we need to breathe life into them. And maybe this is a statement directly, you know, to the students out there. Um, 
it's up to you and it's up to the the people that you represent the theory of change here is that we as as communities we as society will have the effect on what courts do we may have the best theory in the world you know we may we may um come up with some great ideas uh, about human rights but unless there is the 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 you know there's this whole piece of laws literature unless unless we change the idea of what law should be unless we as uh, people uh, make it impossible to address these issues it's not going to happen no matter what your theory is so we have got to demand that courts breathe life into uh, pre-existing laws that that new statutes are passed and that all of it is enforced and without that um, there won't be meaning that's given to laws that exist or laws that are new laws that are passed. So can I just follow up quickly? And I'm going to ask you, Maxine, because you mentioned indigenous uh, concepts as well. And several of the Q&As have asked this, which is what can we learn or take away or to go to the pre-existing laws that uh, Professor Lotto mentioned? Um, are there concepts or lessons or ways of, of thinking about how indigenous peoples approach law and nature and the relationship that could be um, more effectively learned from and then maybe tools to use to further environmental and climate justice. Yeah, happy to. Um, and the first, one of the things I will say is that these, the, you know, efforts and litigation within countries across the globe that are recognizing rights to a healthy environment are, I think, along the lines of what you're describing. And what we need as well from our students and up and coming lawyers is a really clear, and policymakers, articulation of what we, what the duties are, <laughs> what the, the parallel duties are to uh, actually meet those rights uh, on the part of private sector, government, et cetera. With respect to um, indigenous approaches, I wanna be careful here, obviously, there's no monolith, there's no singular approach. I will say, just give two examples from the Pacific. One is, I think, here in Hawaii, the way in which we have uh, experienced sort of the, the, the confluence of sort of Western law and indigenous um, Native Hawaiian law is in our public trust. And that our public trust is probably one of the stronger articulations. And as you compare it across various states, it's not perfectly executed, but it, it reflects that the fact that this public trust is understood here is a legal descendant, if you will, of, of the Native Hawaiian Kingdom and the approaches to uh, shared spaces. Um, also, Jacinta Ruru is a Maori um, a lawyer and law professor who has uh, written a good deal about what it means to in incorporate indigenous legal orders in a meaningful way um, and have actionable sort of policy that flows from it in the context of New Zealand and Aotearoa. And in, in particular, I think she makes a really important point, which is to say that the, the personhood grant granting of the Fanganui River was not just a kind of, uh, it doesn't equally relate to that sort of um, should trees have standing kind of underst understanding of rights of nature as it was articulated, but also in incorporates Maori cosmology in the way in which the space is managed, right? So it's not just saying, well, if corporations can be people, so can rivers, right? It's actually looking to have the worldview um, be infused in sort of the legal uh, system writ large, at large so that we can um, have the specific laws and approaches have meaning. And I think that's really critically important as we, especially as we look to climate change adaptation, we see it in the US. Um, there are a lot of uh, indigenous management practices that people are looking to, to employ, but out of context, context in some cases can come into direct conflict with what are traditional sort of Western property rights notions, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of possibility there, but a lot of, a lot of in investigation and sort of work to translate that into policy relevant to the particular context that we see. Uh, so we've, we've been getting a lot of there. questions flooding in and I just, um, uh, I'm going to keep going. So whenever, whenever people have to go to sleep, let me know, but I'm willing to keep going here. These are important. Um, somebody just chatted that or texted that um, Justice Barrett is now Justice Barrett, and that that certainly impacts the federal judiciary and, and some of the future in whatever ways it does. But one or two of the questions talked about uh, or asked the question, when, when will mainline environmental groups and maybe the environmental justice movement really recognize that capitalism is the issue? Capitalism is the the problem, so to speak, and that possibly working within the legal system, given the power structures that we have 
And for example, what Professor Torres is mentioning, all the difficulties of just even getting them in court or keeping them in a particular court. Um, how, how would you respond to the question of the interplay between environmental groups and their approaches and environmental justice, and then really the, our capitalist society, which, which consumes huge amounts of resources per capita as your slide showed, Professor Burkett. But um, Professor Faber, do you wanna start on that one? Yeah, a couple things I would say. Um, <clears throat> I think we're in the midst of a unprecedented attack on the environmental movement and other major social movements. I think one of the primary goals of corporate-led globalization is to facilitate the increased displacement of ecological harm in the waste, commodity, productive, and um, money circuits of capital onto not only marginalized communities within the United States, but throughout the global South. So yes, through processes of global unequal ecological exchange, we've seen in which ways that global capital is facilitating the massive appropriation of ecological space in the global South, the massive appropriation of increasingly undervalued resources. So this process of corporate-led globalization is subordinating the most basic fundamental human rights, citizen rights, civil rights to the private property rights of capital. So free trade agreements increasingly undermining various forms of national legislation that result in increasingly different peoples, governments, regions of the world being pitted against another in a bid to attract investment that's leading to this downward pressure on regulations, the attack on law uh, of all kind, particularly environmental law. So, you know, I think there's the profit imperative of global capitalism is really foundational to this assault that we're seeing on all types of law. And so uh, I think one of the most important struggles is really for um, fair trade practices, for example, because, and as well as human rights, because without those, uh, we cannot really make progress in these other areas. The other thing that's kind of interesting about climate justice very quickly is that um, there are many different ways that we can think about climate justice and, and injustice. There are intergenerational injustices, the impacts that climate change is going to have on future generations. I think that's a, a basis for legal action. The ways in which climate change has these international impacts that are differentiated, whether it's the Pacific Islands. And so we've seen, for example, that uh, many communities that have been impacted by the actions of U.S. multinationals overseas, whether that be Nigeria or Ecuador or Burma, have brought action against U.S. corporations in U.S. courts. And also the manner in which, you know, we're seeing a rollback of many of the most important laws regarding civil rights or environmental justice within the United States. So I'm really interested in ways that sort of we can open up new avenues for taking legal action to take into account a fuller range of impacts around climate justice that have been outside the traditional boundaries of, of U.S. law. I want to, I'm mindful of the time, we're about nine o'clock, so I want to ask one more question, and then I want to, I do want to say to people that, um, who are listening, that there have been a lot of great questions, and what I will do and working with Josh and Allison is we will save the chats. We will um, send them to our speakers and and try to you know if people can respond to some of them that haven't been addressed. But there, this we did get some questions. This is being recorded. We will share the recording with people, um, and we will also share the slides. So we did get a questions, a couple questions from a couple of young. Uh, students um, who are grad students or undergraduates. And one of them, interestingly, uh, and again, this is something that has been uh, under attack is science and by certain people and sort of the disregard for science. And she asks about, she's planning on doing her PhD on, um, and I won't describe it all, but she's a chemist. And so taking, trying to do ways of, of approaching dioxins and other things in clean water. But her, she's finding as, a, as an African-American woman and a grad student or a student, difficulty in finding funding. And so her question was, do panelists know of ways in which scientists or students, young students and, and law students or others 
can enter the conversation and be part of the EJ movement and, and lend their expertise and their interests and their passions to this movement when they are not law students. I'll, I'll jump into that quickly, which we, we partner with a lot of scientists. Um, in fact, the Climate Justice Clinic is a joint effort in the School of Public Health and the School of the Environment and Law School. The theory there is that community groups um, uh, need to build a record. They need to build a record of environmental hazard. They, need to, they don't need to be studied. That's a whole different issue. Um, they're not objects. They're, they're uh, makers of their own future. And so working in partnership through community-based participatory research or listening and going to meetings and find out what people want, just like lawyers need to, um, we, we have been working uh, with many um, scientists, uh, either soloing or in academia. Historically, black colleges and universities have historically had centers um, of environmental justice. And there is, there is a tremendous amount that can be done with uh, community-based science, used to be called citizen science, um, and all kinds of fields, epidemiology, chemistry, water monitoring, air monitoring. So absolutely, there are many, many ways in which students from many disciplines can get involved and, uh, and not only students, but people who are interested. Uh, the only caveat is to really think as lawyers should think about serving the community, not uh, objectifying the community. And the Union of Concerned Scientists has been working with uh, the EJ initiative to really develop training and, um, and guidelines for thinking about how can I, as a scientist, or how can I, as a technical assistance provider, really be in service to, rather than objectifying or doing some kind of helicopter scientists, uh, science work, um, how can I serve the community and, and, and what do I need to know? And what do I need to think about to be of service? So I want to, I want to give each of our panelists sort of one minute uh, closing, uh, closing argument, closing points that they might want to leave for the audience remaining, and then I'll, I'll wrap things up. So um, I'm going to start from west to east. So I'll start with Professor Burkett. I, there's, there's so many things I, I, I might add. I mean, I think this is obviously the first of, of, of many necessary conversations that need to happen. I'll just um, offer that there is really exciting and important work being done on thinking about, uh, to the question earlier, about our current political economy, which is where I do think a lot of the inquiry needs to go, um, uh, around plan D growth, what it looks like actually to make that transition in an equitable fashion, um, and to do so uh, recognizing that we are going through uh, transition uh, is, is inevitable because of the change in climate. And we have an opportunity either to do it in a planned, coordinated and cooperative, a collaborative way, and maybe even a reparative way, or we can sort of amble along um, and, and wait for it to happen to us. And so I just encourage us to sort of think about this as an opportunity to make the change and look to preferred futures and write a different story as we're moving forward. Okay, I, I'm not sure who's next West in the West, but um... I'll go on my screen. So Professor Torres, I'll let you go next, and then Professor Lado, and then Professor Faber. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in a plug. Uh, I put it in the chat, but, but we're, uh, on November 14th and 15th, we're having a, a conference on, on global environmental justice, in which some of the issues that were surfaced in this conversation will be, will, will be pursued in depth. And we're gonna have people from the global south uh, as well as people from uh, from uh, the global north, uh, as uh, as lead lead presenters. So I think you know we get to examine these. But I mean the, uh, I mean, the a lot of the things we're talking about are really on the margins of the categories that people um, uh, that that lawyers anyway uh, work with. So you know climate refugees aren't really even a legal category, right? I mean, they, we know there's going to be massive uh, migration that is prompted by, by, by climate. We'd better have a response, right? We'd better start thinking about that. And, and lawyers should start thinking about that, not uh, in view of, of the, the problem, but in view of the system that they inhabit and how can they work to transform it. I want to underline the, the point that, that uh, uh, Professor Engelman Leto made, which is... The, all of the students out there can, can be of service to environmental justice groups. 
but I under a lot of service, right? And that means uh, listening first and then uh, helping where you can. And the last thing I'll cl close with is, is don't think you don't have power, right? I mean, power is, it, it, power, there's power over, there's power to, there's power with, and power with is the kind of power that actually allows you to move the frame of reference that makes some futures uh, possible that we don't even imagine at this moment. And that's what I would urge you to do, is to, is to take uh, an assessment of and, and, and control of the power that you actually do have. Great, uh, Professor Engelman Lotto. One thing I've been thinking about as we've been talking over the last few minutes is um, the point about externalization of costs, which I, you know, I think is so fundamental that Professor Faber and, and others have been talking about. And, and fundamentally, this is about capitalism and this is, is about externalizing costs, whether it's the costs of um, actually getting rid of waste or I do a lot of work in North Carolina with communities that have been fighting hog facilities that have been externalizing the cost of raising hogs and, and the meat we eat. Um, really important. At the same time, what I'm wrestling with is um, we can't let the discussion of economics obscure the continuing role of race in our society and in, our, in, our, in the globe. And, um, and if we do, we risk not understanding the forces and the ways in which um, capitalism and demagoguery can separate us and we obscure our history. And the only path to uh, fundamentally reshifting where we're going in a more productive way is to recognize, look ourselves in the mirror and make the changes we need to make. So that's, that's what I would leave us with, that we have to, if COVID laid nothing else bare, I hope, um, and there's no silver lining to this. It's the ways in which we segregate people, the ways in which we uh, put people in congregate settings, the ways in which we uh, push people into unsafe conditions and the ways in which we've segregated people by race um, fundamentally put people at risk, shorten their lives and are unacceptable in our society. And that's what we have to address. Great, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Faber. I'd just like to echo that. Um, I think there's a famous song that goes, uh, it's always darkest before the dawn. And uh, I think we're facing an unprecedented economic um, and climate crisis, and as well as COVID-19. And what's interesting to me at this point is the global ruling classes and power structures around the world have shown themselves utterly incapable of resolving these crises. In fact, are intensifying issues of systemic racism and so forth as a way of diverting attention away from the failings of the system itself. And so um, I am uh, somewhat optimistic and hopeful in the tremendous mobilization that I'm now seeing taking place, particularly among youth and for peoples all over the world. And I think it will take a mass mobilization. It will take a mass movement, if you will, to really challenge and, and fundamentally, fundamentally transform these power structures, which are so resistant. And I think the key way to do that is to really take an intersectional analysis, which is to look at the ways in which different issues like affordable housing, having jobs at a living wage, um, healthcare, all intersect with climate change and um, um, environmental justice, and to sh show how people from different walks of life who are normally divided by race, class, ethnicity, place of origin, how we all have a common cause in, in, in the need to fight and overcome economic, social, and environmental injustices. And I think one way you do that is by creating a vision of how we can create an alternative future an alternative society that speaks to the primary concerns of all and offers the promise of a better life. And I think if we can do that, then I think we can create a movement that can change the world. And so I think that's our task is to find ways that we can build solidarity across these racial class uh, and international boundaries. 
Ray, um, those are all great comments. And I just want to add one quick thing to that, which is I think one of the takeaways from what you all said and what we've been talking about is that, and I, I mentioned the Ali quote from uh, the, the foreword of that book, that law is a powerful tool, but law is not the only tool. And, and I want to mention we have a sort of exhibit A in my mind as you were just talking. Dr. Faber was Greta Thunberg, who is a 14-year-old by herself essentially started a movement of youth around the world that has grown and grown and led her to be speaking at the UN and to large corporations and others. And she was just one young woman. And so, and she hung in there. And so our children's trust is, is the group, you know, that Julia Wood started out of Oregon some years ago. They're the ones who've been initiating Juliana and some of the other cases. So one person can make a difference in, in many ways. And there's many examples of that in, in racial justice and other ways as well. But I just want to say also to close this event that each of our panelists as each person has been making big impacts in their respective fields. And that's why to echo Dean softly at the beginning, I personally was thrilled, excited, and, and humbled by everybody accepting the invitation to speak at this webinar. And that I hope, and certainly I want to say on behalf of University of Maine School of Law, people who've attended in the state of Maine, that we, we both thank you and are inspired by you. And I hope that um, the dialogue will continue. We will share, as I said, the recording, the, you know, we'll try to get the Q&As. Uh, also, I know Professor Engelman Lotto was sharing some resources and others were as well. And I will reach out to our panelists afterwards and sort of compile in a Word document some of those resources that are out there. But I encourage people who are still on and still awake and participating and others to communicate with each other because I think we all share the similar concerns about the direction that, that the world is going in, but have the sense that there are ways for each of us to keep fighting, because that's the message I would like to leave is you can never give up. You just, you know, I think all of the panelists and myself included, and Professor Torres said how old he is, and I'm just as old as he is, we're still fighting. You know, it's like beating your head against the wall. And when you do litigation, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you got to go to the next case and you've got to go to the next fight. And whether it's in Alabama, in rural Maine, I mean, Maine has some of the highest lead poisoning rates. Uh, in the country because we have the oldest housing stock in the country and you can just multiply that, et cetera, et cetera. You just got to keep going. And so I hope that the students on this, whoever, wherever you are, use the tools, um, network, reach out and, and everybody else as well because the, we're all in this together. So I want to thank everybody for their time. I hope that the dialogue continues and that people will attend other conferences, webinars, and brainstorm, because uh, hopefully, you know, as Professor Faber said, uh, Dr. Faber said, uh, maybe it's darkness before the dawn, and hopefully we just have to keep waiting, We're not waiting long for the dawn, but we have to create it. Um, the dawn's just not going to come itself. We, we've got to push it, we the people. So um, with that, I want to thank everybody. Uh, Josh or Allison, anything to close that I've missed? You're on mute. Go ahead, Josh. Phenomenal. Just again, thank you to our to our four incredible panelists. Uh, I am continually surprised by the fact that you responded to my email and you said <laughs> yes and you you came here tonight. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your your knowledge with us. And I'm really really grateful on behalf of our participants. Um, thank you. Thank you again, and may we all do this again soon in person. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.